beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
Testament for the eve of the nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, the seventh chapter. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men, that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the epistle from St. John's first letter to the church, 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. This is the gospel of our Lord.
and of all things visible and indivisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not man, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
I remembered my announcement. Um, it's wonderful to see everybody, and we are enjoying seeing each other, and we're going to want to visit following the service, but don't do it in here. Uh, we have to get ready for the second service. It's going to be a quick turnaround, but please go to the Narthex or is the entryway to visit. Everybody wants to say Merry Christmas, so do I, but let's give some space so we can clean and get ready for the second service. Um, second announcement is... Um, all of you who've been doing special music, you're expected to be here and do it again every Sunday. <laughs> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Most things in this world look a lot better from a distance than if you get up close. When we get near a thing, that's when we begin to see its imperfections. From the street, a house may look wonderful, but if you get up close and approach, you'll see every little nick and peel in the paint. The same is true for people. Those actors and actresses who look so wonderful on the screen, they're wearing makeup, you know. And when you get up close, yeah, they're pretty, they're more handsome than I am, but that doesn't take much. But like all of us, they do have their imperfections too. And that's just the outside. If we enter that beautiful house, we might find a week's worth of dishes in the sink, or at least a bed that isn't made like it should be. And that famous movie star's life might just appear perfect in the pages of the magazines or seen from behind the velvet rope as they walk down the red carpet, but they face the same relationship problems that you and I do. They have the same personal insecurities as the rest of us, and their cars break down sometimes, too. And we should all thank doctors and nurses, because they're willing to look at the parts of our bodies that we hide from everyone else. And they then see them when something's wrong with them, too, when they're oozy or smelly or something. Yuck. Of course we don't want other people to see our imperfections. So we cover them up, we put on makeup, we use mouthwash, deodorant, we choose carefully tailored clothes to hide the parts we don't want someone else to see. And we hide our life imperfections too. Behind a sunny Facebook page that makes it look like everything's great in my life, or a stoic I'm fine whenever anybody asks how things are going, even though rarely for any of us is that completely true. We don't want our imperfections to show. That's especially true when it comes to God. We really want to cover our imperfections up from Him. We're all like Adam and Eve. We're all trying to hide our huge sins under little fig leaves. Of course, we use different covers. Maybe we mention the one or two good things that we do as though somehow that makes up for our failings. I know. I misuse God's name as a curse sometimes, well, lots of times, but I do give money to the church and I always help that neighbor shovel her snow if I'm out there when she's out there. Or we make excuses. I can't get my catechism memory work done, Pastor, I have math homework and a basketball game. Or I can't come to church because I'm so tired from a work's wor week's worth of working. Or, I tried real hard, Pastor, to stop yelling at my kids or watching porn or drinking too much, but, you know, it's kind of hard to quit, so I gave up. Or we point to other people whose sins are more obvious and visible than our own, and we say, see, I'm not so bad. I mean, uh, look at that guy. This is an especially strong sin among regular churchgoers. We have a tendency to point to other people and say, well, you know, they're, they're not in worship as much as I am. It's a mis misdirection to try to cover up our own sins. We use these arguments like they're spiritual makeup. We're attempting to hide the reality that's underneath. We try to hide it from other people, and we want to hide it from God. Um, it's a defense mechanism. And as that defense mechanism, then we sometimes say, hmm, 
maybe let's just treat God like he's a good concept. God's, God's in the spiritual realm. And oh yeah, I believe in him in the spiritual realm. And I visit him there once a week. But you know, the rest of my life I live out in the real world. And God's not really there. God doesn't have a place there. Then we come here and we put on our best spiritual face. Try to hide the truth of our lives. Try to hide the reality inside us. We try to hide it from God. But then comes Christmas. Christmas blows that idea to smithereens. Because in Christ Jesus, God just walks right into our world. He doesn't knock at the door and give us a chance to clean it up first. Here he is. And he encounters the world as it really is. Imperfections, sins, everything. God became one of us to experience human life from the inside. He was cold when he was born. The smell of animals was strong in his nose. His perfect baby skin was all scratched and itchy from the hay. And he was tired and he was hungry. And what was that horrible smell? And oh my goodness, it's me, my diaper's full. I'm sure Mary was a great mother. But she wasn't the perfect, serene, sinless woman that we paint her to be. And we should speak with her, of her with respect like that. But we need to remember that she was also the frazzled, exhausted, afraid young mother that many of you have once been, and many more of you will one day be. And Joseph, the proud father, standing in all the pictures, fearlessly ready to protect and care for his family, which he did admirably. But he also was worried that he wouldn't measure up. Just look at the terrible lodgings he managed for his poor wife, and he's supposed to care for her. Imagine he looked at Mary and Jesus and said, you know, I'm not so sure I'm ever going to make enough money to give them everything that I want them to have. God didn't just sit up in heaven and survey the world from a distance so as to miss all of our imperfections. He came close. He came among us. He came into the world. God came into this world up close and personal among us with human flesh, so that he could touch us, so that, yes, he could even smell us. God came to live on the inside of our world and of our life here. Jesus heard all those arguments coming out of the neighbor's house as they yelled at each other at night. And he probably heard an argument or two in his own home. He saw kids getting picked on in school, and unless Nazareth Elementary School was different from every other elementary school in the world, Jesus was also probably mistreated because he did the right thing. Jesus had friends who betrayed him, like we do. Jesus healed the sick. And when he did, he saw the pus and the blood, and he smelled it, and he looked at it, and he saw what sickness and sin do to our bodies. Jesus certainly knew and loved people who died at a young age, people he'd grown up with, people he loved, his friends. God the Son walked in this world for real. In this world where sometimes the good is rejected and the evil is supported and embraced, where real people have gray hair and sagging midriffs and zits and freckles and whatever feature it is about you that you wish you didn't have, which, by the way, most people don't usually notice about you, but you sure do. Jesus knew the way this world can look and smell and taste from the inside as up close and personal as possible. He saw it all, and he did not turn away in disgust. Jesus did not reject us when he lived our truth. He saw our sin. He saw our suffering, our evil, our weakness. 
Jesus saw our illness and our depression, our failures, our laziness. He knew our anger and our dark secrets. He saw it all, and yet he didn't turn away. Instead, he had compassion. Jesus loved us, still loves us, loves you and me. He even said here, all that horrible stuff, pour it on me. Christ took the blame for all of our sins, all your guilt, all the ugliness that's in your heart. He asked for it, and he took it as his own. He was rejected by the world. He was abandoned by his friends. He was led outside of the town, out to the wasteland to be tortured and crucified, and he died. And so amazingly, miraculously, God, God felt death in his body and in his soul. And as all this was happening, as the weight of everything you have ever done wrong, all of my sins, all of my errors, all the brokenness and imperfection of this world, as it was all heaped on him, and as the spikes of the punishment for that sin were driven into his hands and his feet, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Jesus saw it all, felt it all, heard it all, lived it all, and he did not flinch away. He loved and he loves and he forgives and he makes you new. From a distance, the nativity scene looked pure and gentle and holy, and it's all of those things. But when we get up close, we see it's more. Because up close here, we see the fearless compassionate Son of God entering a world that hates Him. A world where even we, His people, don't do what He tells us to do. Even we, His people, love ourselves more than we love Him, more than we love other people. We betray Him. Look into the manger and see the fearless and loving God who comes to us to save us. And he is the God who comes to you. Jesus penetrates that spiritual makeup make that you put on, of rationalization and misdirection, everything you put on to try to hide the truth. He sees right through it. He sees your sin. Jesus wades right into your reality. He sees your lust and your anger. He hears your gossip and the cruel words that you speak. He hears when you lie. He sees when you ignore him most of the time. And he sees how you mistreat and look down on your fellow human beings. He sees your struggles. He sees your pain and your worry. He sees your zits and he smells your garlic breath. And he feels your sorrow. And he feels your depression and your anxiety. And he feels the pain that you have daily and the worry and your loneliness. He feels your empty stomach as you wonder where your next meal will come from. And he, hear, he feels your health scares. He knows your inadequacies. He knows that you're not good enough. He knows you're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not rich enough. He sees. He knows. He feels. And he does not turn away. He has compassion on you. He has love for you. He has mercy for you. The holy and almighty God of all things has come to you and he's come for you. Not to punish you, but to save you from all those things. His blood on the cross was shed for your sins. His holy life was sacrificed to remove all your imperfections, all your failures. He, he came for you so you don't need to hide your sins and lock them up from him. Confess them. You will receive his forgiveness. And you will receive the relief that comes from having your guilt removed. And you will receive even the strength of Jesus Christ to try to do better. You don't need to hide your inadequacies. He already knows them all. And he promises he will remain with you anyway. And he will help you through all of them. 
our Lord God has come among us. And he remains with us in mercy, in compassion, in power. He's come to this imperfect world to you, an imperfect person. And he's forgiven you. And he cares for you here in this life. But in the end, the ultimate purpose, the ultimate plan of that manger in Bethlehem is so that the God who came to us here can take you to himself in heaven. Where all the imperfection will be no more. Jesus knows every sin and failure of your life, and that's a good thing. Because he knows them all. And so to all of them, he says, I forgive you. He knows all your weaknesses, and he says, come to me, I want you to be mine. Come with me, I have come for you. Be with me, so that eternally you can be mine. God did not stay at a distance so that he could come bring you to himself so that you live eternity with him, not at a distance, but basking in his perfection. Merry Christmas. Amen. The peace of God that passes all human understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds fixed on Christ Jesus. Amen.
unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you 